welcome to your intended message. My guest today is Andrew Bryant. Here's three facts that I think you should know about Andrew. One, he, he has he has a mixed pedigree uh, nationality-wise. He's English by birth, Australian by passport, currently living in Portugal, and a managing director of a Singapore company, and Brazilian by wife. And that's, of course, the most important one. Uh, second fact about Andrew, he's the author of four books, including Self-Leadership and the New Leadership Playbook, Being Human Whilst Delivering Accelerated Results. And the third fact, he's passionate about waking people up to their best possible selves, whether that is the C-suite of a company or disadvantaged teenagers. And I'm not sure which is the more difficult group to work with. Andrew, <laughs> welcome to your intended message. George, thank you. And thank you for the introduction. Um, yes, it's a good question. Which is the more difficult? Sometimes C-suite leaders act like disadvantaged te teenagers. So uh, they're both difficult audiences, but one makes my heart swell a lot more than the other. And I'll leave your audience to imagine which one that is. <laughs> Delighted to have you here, Andrew, and to be talking to you um, all the way from Portugal. And your, your focus is on self-leadership. And that's a term that is that we don't hear every day. What does that mean to you? Uh, it, it's interesting we don't hear it every day. I, I've been talking about self-leadership for over 20 years, um, and it's now quite popular, actually. Um, when I, you, You're absolutely right. When I first started talking about it, uh, nobody had much of an interest in it, except it does go back to the Greek philosophers, Epictetus, uh, and, and the Roman philosophers, Epictetus, and Aristotle, the... The, uh, the Chinese philosophers, Lao Tzu, everybody is talking about um, you know, mastering self is true strength. Um, when I looked at self-leadership uh, back in the late 1990s, I saw it as, a, as an intentional practice, which is a nice alignment to uh, the title of your show, The Intended Message. And in fact, in 2012, I published a book with Dr. Anna Kazan, and in that book, we defined self-leadership as a practice, the practice of intentionally influencing your thinking, feeling, and actions towards your objectives. And, and the important thing about that is being an intentional human being. The metaphor, of course, is we're all on a bus. The question is, are we driving the bus or are we a passenger in the bus of our, our lives, our careers, our professions? And, and self-leadership is very much about getting in the driver's seat taking ownership and responsibility, and, and therefore choosing your destination. That self-leadership, which is more important, the, the emotional control or the intellectual logical control? Well, that's a forced question. I mean, as somebody who understands communication, you put me in a box. It's not either or, it's and. And we are both uh, logical and emotional machines or entities or beings. Um, you can't have one without the other. We, we know that if you're rational without emotion, uh, you lose all persuasion, persuasion and influence. And if you're emotional without logic, then you know, you're out of control. So that's why the definition is the intentional uh, the practice of intentionally influencing both thinking, feeling, and actions, because, because both our thinking and feeling drive our actions, and it's, it's by our actions that we're going to be, be known. So it's very much an and. We need both. Um, and, and Aristotle, two and a half thousand years ago, and you would know this, wrote four books on rhetoric, you know, the four books on, on how to communicate to on mass, and he talked about logos, logic, pathos, which gives us the word empathy. Um, and ethos, which gives us the word character. And, and he said, we need all three. We can't have one without the other if we want to be a successful communicator. And Andrew, when you are working with, with the C-suite, when do they come to you recognizing what their challenge is, or do they come to you for one reason and you discover or point out, well, here's the real issue. It's over here. Um, it, it depends. Uh, it, it can be either or. 
and and back to and it can it can be both sometimes we think the problem is a and it turns out to be c d e or f um some people are are self aware and, and there are three pillars to self leadership the first of course is self awareness and I, I, I'm I'm blessed that I have many of my clients are self-aware and they go, look, I'm struggling with this. This is getting my way. I'm tripping into this. I need some help. And it's fantastic when they start with that self-awareness. Sometimes clients are sent to me and they are lacking the self-awareness. And then the real challenge is to bring the aha moment, to hold up the mirror and say, hey, I know you think you you sound like this, that you're doing this, but here's what it really looks like. And they, you know, they have this epiphany, this road to Damascus moment and go, oh my God, that was never my intention. And you go, yeah, I get that, but this is what's happening. So it can be both. Um, and sometimes it's fun. I mean, you know, the narrative, the, the communication. Um, I remember one particular executive and, and we're friends to this day. In fact, he, he just contributed a section to, to my latest book. And, and I, on our first session, he was telling me what his problem is. And I leaned back and I went, so it's like you're a justice warrior. And he's like, what did you just say? I said, it was like, you know, you, you, it doesn't matter what happens. You have to put yourself in the way and go rescue people because it has to be fair. And his face just, oh my God, he said, that's my whole life. I, I've, I'm constantly sabotaging myself because I'm trying to rescue somebody else. And I never realized you've nailed it. And so when you do it so succinctly, you look really clever when that happens. And I wish it happened every time as quickly as that, but um, you know, justice warrior. And he just labeled him and the label gave him the cure, how to step back from that and have some flexibility. So, so now that's curious. Sometimes um, labeling the activity is enough to, to, to provide the insight to, to, to fix it, to, to correct. Can be. Um, I, I love the metaphor of dragons. Um, and they're, they're mythical creatures, but we all have our own dragons, you know, whether that's a, a negative self-talk or a, a lack of self-belief or self-worth. And, and the interesting thing is that we feed our own dragons, don't we? We, 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 we? we talk negatively about ourselves or other people, and those dragons get bigger and bigger and bigger, fatter and fatter and fatter. Um, and at some point in, in coaching and recognizing that inner narrative, well, you, you got to just stop feeding that dragon. You got to put it on a diet. You've got to stop this. And then the dragon gets smaller and smaller. But the trick is to never let the dragon go away completely because those dragons serve us a purpose. The, the negative self-talk, the, the pessimism, it actually protects us from hubris. It protects us from doing really stupid things. So, um, I, I've got a good friendly relationship with my own dragons. My, you know, I know that you know these are some things that if I feed them, uh, you know, will get me out in, in a lot of trouble. Thankfully, I'm at an age where I've tamed those dragons, and I have people around me that can hold me accountable. And they go, "Hey, you know, Andrew, you, you're going a bit too far this way." And I go, "Ah, oh, yes, I'm playing that one out." So that's where this you you move from self awareness into self regulation or self management. Uh, which is the second pillar of self leadership is okay. I I know that you know I I can I can be a victim of hubris or arrogance or um, ridiculousness or whatever your particular uh, dragon is. Andrew, I'm curious. Uh, are you are you willing to share one? Tell us about one of the dragons that you had to tame. <sighs> yeah, I, I I think so. I think. I I think I had a, I I think a younger version of me, you know I, I'm 60, so I like to think of myself as version 6.0. But I mean, if I think about version 2.0, 2.5, there there was a there was a need to be the center of attention, and the underlying fear of that was a fear of in, insignificance. I, I'm not making a difference. I haven't I haven't done enough, and I was overcompensating, particularly in my early years. And, and then forcing my way into the conversation or the need for center of attention. And that actually sabotaged a lot of my outcomes. Um, it's so nice to be version 6.0 and be in a room and not need to be the center of attention. Let somebody else take it um, and just say the right thing at the right time when I need to. Um, and, and it's just so pleasurable. And I remember the younger version of me and I think, oh yeah, I would have had to have said something there. Now I don't have to. Um, and that's just... Uh, incredibly refreshing and, and much more relaxing. 
Andrew, what conversation or series or types of conversations did you have with yourself to tame that dragon? Um, well, it was breaking the dragon down. So dra dragons are a construct, right? They, you know, anything in our brain is a construct. I mean, we, we as human beings are meaning-making machines. We, we construct meaning out of anything that happens, right? So it was recognizing, um, well, well, why do I do this? What do I get out of this? What, what's, what, what am I protecting myself from? What am I trying to achieve? And, and is this my narrative or I haven't inherited it? And, and, and one of the epiphanies for me was one of my sisters saying, oh, you're being dad. And I'm like, what? And, you know, I was like, my father was a, was a big man and, and he, you know, he always took up space when he went into a room. And I'm not as, uh, I'm reasonably, you know, I, I'm a reasonable statue, but I'm not as big as my father was. And so, you know, I was trying to be dad. I was like, oh my God, I'm living his life, not mine. So what am, what am I trying to achieve? And asking the, the really great coaching question is, well, is this, is this behavior serving me, right? Um, Dr. Phil purloined this or, you know, it became a catchphrase. How's that working out for you? And it's like, well, it wasn't. So what options and choices I have? And that's you know, key to self-leadership. What, what are my options? Because options lead us to opportunities. And realizing that in any situation, any scenario, we always have options. And, and so I reckon I have, I have other options. I have other ways of doing this. I can, I can make myself feel okay in other ways. And I can ask myself my outcomes, you know, am I better to shine the spotlight on somebody else? Am I better to ask a question rather than make a bombastic statement? And, and I'm curious about some of those initial questions that you might have asked yourself once you, once you uh, realized that you were trying to be dad, uh, did, did you ask yourself, well, why am I do that? Is it, am I simply copying him or am I trying to live up to his standards or is it a, is it a, um, is it a no. competition between us? Did, were, did those kind of thoughts go through your mind? Well, this was this, this particular example that we have is a, is a long time ago. And so there are a number of things that I think, you know, with what I know about psychology and therapy, I think you know many of us are running narratives and patterns unconsciously from our parents. And I, you know, many years ago, I went through some processes to release those and and choose what I wanted to be. So often, often our parental patterns aren't, they're, they're not our choice. We just adopted them, recognizing that a they were a pattern and therefore I had the choice was important. One. Um, second, perhaps epiphany from this uh, that I'll share with you and and your viewers, George, is 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 recognizing that I left home at uh, eighteen, went off to university, and twenty five, I moved from England to Australia, and I left my parents behind. I went off to to be my own man in in Australia, but I, I didn't leave behind the narrative. Oh, I must phone dad up and tell him I did this. He would be proud of me. And, and I, I recognized over the years that, you know, I, I had that narrative. And I also recognized that a period when he got somewhat older, a little bit more frail, that I no longer needed that affirmation. I, I now knew, actually, I did a good job and I don't need dad or anybody else to tell me I did a good job. Um, and it's interesting, you know, people can get all the way to the C-suite and still need that external validation. Paradoxically, you know, to, to get into the C-suite, usually you've got to let go of that need for validation. And I remember, at a time going, you know, I, I don't, I'm good. I don't need that. And then, you know, unfortunately, of course, you know, everybody comes to the end of their life. And I, uh, I went back to England. He was in a hospice and he was in his last few days. And I, I was, thankfully I was with, with him at the end and he squeezed my hand and, and said, I'm proud of you, son. And that was a, a beautiful, beautiful moment. And I'm very grateful I had it, but I no longer needed it. Um, it was, it was nice affirmation that he was proud of me, but I had, I had resolved that for myself because we'd been apart. And yeah, I know I, I coach uh, people all the time who never had that. Uh, I'm so super grateful I did, and, and it was very special. Uh, and so you kind of have to have a narrative with sometimes a, a dead parent or a dead relative and say, well, actually, they were proud of me. Um, they may never have said it. Actually, they loved me. Maybe they never said it. Um, I, I had an example of um, 
a lady who'd gone all the way through to just before getting into an Olympic team and had an injury and had to drop out. Um, and a whole world came crashing down. And her parents weren't supportive because she was no longer the Olympic athlete. And she kind of drew this narrative that I'm only important when I'm an athlete and I can never win my parents' affection because I'm not a winner, you know. And uh, and her parents passed and I had to have a conversation with her and say, that's irrelevant. You get to choose whether you're valuable or not, not them. And it sounds like part of self-leadership is self-validation, being willing to to validate oneself without depending on that external validation, which is nice once in a while. It's, it's, it's always nice to hear somebody say something and mean it, uh, but yeah. uh, but we need to be comfortable with ourself. Yeah, well, I draw a, a lot of time people, you know, uh, particularly for executives, they're looking for executive presence, the ability to project gravitas and confidence and poise under pressure. And so they're looking for that confidence. And a lot of people will say to me, Andrew, I, you know, I really need to develop my confidence. And sometimes it is confidence they need. But to what you're speaking is the self-esteem that is underneath the confidence. Confidence is I've done it in the past, I'm doing it now, and therefore I can project into the future that I'm likely to be able to be successful doing that again. But self-esteem is the self-value underneath that. Uh, because the word esteem is is an old word for value, isn't it? So it's self-value. And it's it's actually a verb, not a noun. We don't have self-esteem as a fixed quantity. It's it's a daily process, like taking a shower. You know, it, it works for a few hours, and then you're going to need another one. We, we need to self-value on, on a regular basis to know what our value proposition is. And so some people who say, I lack confidence, actually are not, they don't know their own value. One of the exercises I do in my, my workshops, whether that's in person or online, is I get people to say, hi, my name is fill in blank. My value to my organization is. And, you know, people really struggle with this. They, they talk about their role and the things they do. I go, yeah, all of those things are great, but we could find somebody else to fill that role, to do that job. What is your value? What is it that you uniquely bring to your position? And a lot of people struggle with that, but when they get it, oh, well, actually, I'm valuable. And then they usually realize they're being undervalued. Um, and then it's uh, then we use the self-leadership to move into the executive presence and then into the influence capital. You know, how do I get paid and or how do I generate a business for, for, for the value that I'm providing? Andrew, you were listing the three pillars of self-leadership. You told us two so far. What's the third one? You're tracking very nicely, George. Yes. So first is is uh, self awareness. Second, second is self regulation, and the third is self learning, which uh, you know, we're doing here on the on on your show today. Um, is that we're constantly learning. We're going, okay, did that work? Um, how did I do? You know, where was the room for improvement? And the thing that you notice about self leaders is that they can take feedback. And in fact, they go beyond feedback. They they seek feed forward. They reach in, you know, to other people. You know, what could I have done better? You know, where's my where's my room for improvement? So rather than waiting for your boss to give you an annual performance review, you're constantly going, you know, not how how did I do because you need self validation. How could I do that I could make this better? And they're very comfortable that who they are is one thing. What they do is always room for improvement. Right. So, you know, you and I are having this conversation. You have no right uh, and neither will I give you permission to evaluate who I am as a person. But as a, as a, as a podcast host, you could evaluate my effectiveness as a guest. And, and you'd have a set of criteria around that. You've had some great guests, you've had some good guests, and you've had some guests that you know, were more trouble than they were worth, I'm sure, um, because that's life, right? So hopefully I don't fall into that last category, but if I do, that's your judgment, not my judgment of myself. And that, um, I, I think, is a, is a critical point there, Andrew, because if I heard it right, what who we are, we need to be comfortable with. However, what we do or how we do, the, the our behavior or actions, those things could be improved, might be criticized, and that doesn't affect who we are. You got it. Well done. Um, people spend their whole life missing that key point, that I am what I do. 
um, you know, I, I, people people get their identity wrapped up in what they do, and if that doesn't work, I've I've been through I've been through a, a business disruption. I, I you know I went from wealthy to broke almost overnight, um, and that is a traumatic experience. I'm glad I've had it. I'm glad it's a long way behind me, and I've rebuilt my life and my business from that. But I, I absolutely went through a few moments of you know, absolute self-doubt and self-loathing and lack of self-worth because what I did didn't work. And the, 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 the ultimate measure, of course, finance, right? The, the money we use is for, for measuring things. You know, I had gone from wealthy to, to, to $300,000 in debt with zero assets. And that is seriously challenging. And I came out, the only way I survived that was to separate well, this is who I am, and this is what I did. That didn't work, but that means I've got options and choices to do something else. And you know, it turned out that that was a that was great because it 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 started me on the path to researching and writing around self leadership, and then leadership, and and all the things that I've subsequently been able to do. So yes, well done, George. Who we are is different from what we do, and as long as we can keep those separate. Um, we can understand that our behaviors can always be improved. And that's why I wrote the new leadership playbook because in, uh, you know, post the pandemic, very much we need to be able to lead people in terms of the behaviors that make a difference and the humanity of those behaviors. Because if they're not driven by humanity, then they can just be re you know, re replaced by a robot or an AI. So um, that's what's really uh, interesting about the world that we now currently live in. You mentioned the new leadership playbook. Who's it for? What will they gain from it? Um, well, I, let me take a step back and tell you how it came about. Um, so this is my fourth book, and it was actually sort of commissioned by one of my clients who said, look, you're working with our, our CEO, you're working with the executive leadership team. We need a book for our frontline managers or first-time managers. Could you could you write a book for us and, and and create some workshops around that? Now, way back in my past, I'd done management training, but I, I focused on leadership. And I thought, well, I've got all these notes. I could put them together. And I said to them, well, you know, I could I could write this, but can I hold on to the IP? So I write what you need, which is you know your company culture book, and I get to keep the IP. And, and we came to an agreement on that. I delivered the training and the culture piece for them, which they've gone on and done a tremendous job with. I got to keep the IP and I've expanded the book and realized that it's both for new managers, experienced managers, and it's for the leaders who need a framework to develop their team. Right? Because we all have a hodgepodge of leadership principles or leadership values or leadership ideas. But the beauty of a play, and using the sporting analogy, you know, American football you know, has a play. Um, chess has a series of lines, which are plays. You, know, you learn an opening in chess, you know, Queen's Gambit, for instance. And, and so you know that there are certain moves that are really useful in certain contexts. And so this book, I've identified 12 specific behaviors, which include conversations like the feedback conversation like the critical conversation, like the career development conversation, like the objective conversation, and given really practical behavioral examples and connected those to the intentionality because being a self-leadership writer and researcher, I'm always going to come back to intentionality. And this is where you and I are on the same page, George, your intended message. What are you trying to achieve? Here's how best to go about that. So it's, uh, it's for anybody in business right now. And, um, uh, it's uh, it's coming out very soon. Well, it'll be out by the time this uh, goes to air. So check it out on Amazon. Uh, you can find the book on Amazon. It's the new new leadership playbook. You can also visit the website, thenewleadershipplaybook.com. Theleadershipplaybook.com. And you can find the link in the description below. Andrew, when you sit down with a leader to help them on through this process. Are there some standard questions that you often start the conversation with? Um, I think once upon a time, I, I remember, I mean, I've, I've been a coach for nearly 25 years and I've, I've trained coaches. And the concept of coaching is always, I mean, the word coach transports you from point A where you are to point B where you're going. So any conversation is either going to start with, well, where are you at? What's happening? Or where you do want to be? 
And then somewhere in that conversation is either what's blocking you from point A to point B, right? Or what led, what preceded you being in point A. Now, what preceded you being in point A is often therapy, right? What happened, what's your history? And what's blocking you is, is often the coaching. And this is an oversimplification. So, you know, I, I start every conversation just, you know, you know, hello, <laughs> and, and what's happening for you right now? And we're straight into a narrative. Whatever anybody is saying, they they are sharing their, their physical, their emotional state of mind, state of body, state of context at that point. And as a listener, I'm listening, well, what's happening and what meaning are they making out of what's happening? And then I'm questioning, you know, to some extent, how's that useful to you? You know, is that the best way to look at this? Is this, the, are you considering your resources, your choices, and are you looking for opportunity? And you might like this, I, I may, maybe you, you know this already, but um, excuse me, I've got something that's going ping, ping here. I thought I turned everything off that made noises. Um, opportunity actually is a wind, um, just like a tornado or a hurricane are wind, winds. An opportunity is a wind that takes us back to port to our home port typically. And so, you know, if you're stuck in the doldrums, which is, you know, the area of no wind, you've got to, you know, clean the boat, get the get the sails ready. So when the wind comes, when that opportunity comes, you can hoist your sail and get back to port. And having been through a few crises in my own life, I, I shared a financial one, I've, I've, I've faced the health crisis. Each time, you know, you, you think that uh, everything's ended, it's all over. And you, but you get yourself ready, the wind will come, you hoist the sail and you look for that opportunity. And, and this is the entrepreneurial mindset. This is the success mindset that there's always an option and there's always an opportunity. And uh, that, that's the key to self-leadership. Um, and uh, I mean, it was the poem by Henley, which was much loved by Nelson Mandela. That is, you know, it matters not how straight the gate, how charged with punishment, the scroll. I am the master of my fate. I am the captain of my soul. Powerful words. Andrew, you uh, you mentioned crisis you, and, and you, you gave an example of your own. I'm wondering, in order to become an effective leader, is it is it helpful or mandatory that we have been through at least one crisis? Um, I like to say I never wish adversity to happen to anybody, but neither do I wish it not, because it really is only in adversity that we truly understand ourselves, our mettle, and what we're capable of. So I don't prescribe crisis, but uh, I would be very suspicious of uh, somebody in a leadership position that hadn't faced one. I mean, a key interview question for anybody is not, well, okay, great. What did you do well? Tell me about all your successful projects. Every interview should contain, tell me about a disaster, tell me about something went wrong, and tell me how you handled that. Um, because that's where we, we get to see, did they self-reflect or did they blame everybody else? Did they take the ownership responsibility and set about new tasks? So um, I'd be loath to use the word mandatory as you used. I think that's, a, and yet we both know what we're talking about. I would not trust somebody who had not been through some tough times because we don't, they've never been tested. And, and we we never know how somebody's going to behave when it when it gets really bad. Um, there's a there's a, actually I, I mentioned this in in my book that uh, I, w I was talking to somebody who um, described a very very successful female CEO who was perfect. You know, she listened to her staff and you know she was empathetic and everything was going well. But when the business hit tough times, she wasn't able to step into the directive mode and say, okay, we need to do this, this, and this. And so she hadn't got that leadership style under her belt. And so she was replaced by a very directive leader. Uh, leadership, of course, is contextual. If you're on an airplane at you know, 35,000 feet and the oxygen masks do fall from the ceiling, if the captain comes out of the cockpit and says, Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to form some focus groups and, you know, we should discuss what I should do about this. We would, you know, even the atheists would be getting religion at this point, right? So um, I'm looking for somebody who's, you know, if, if somebody, I'm going to listen to somebody, I want to know that they've been tested. Um, and if I'm going to help somebody, I will ask them, you know, tell me about a time 
where, you know, you faced adversity. How did you handle it? What was the narrative? What were the actions you took? And I'm hearing there that part of leadership, strong leadership, is the ability to adapt to the the needs of the situation, as opposed to saying, well, this is the way I always do things, so I'll just do it my way all the time. It doesn't matter what's happening. Yeah. Uh, I, I, there's, a, there's a lot of research around um, leadership that I've read over the years. I mean, I, I'm external faculty on a couple of MBA programs, and when I took my own MBA, I had to read all this research. And I, I, like, the, I like to look at leadership as a three-legged stool. There's the leader style, you know, are they directive? Are they, you know, are they participative? What is their default style? The followers motivation and skill set and the context, whether it's stable or volatile. So the example I used with the airplane, this is a volatile environment, the Austrian masses fall. And we need in this stage, a very directive leader to handle that situation. But it's interesting. I, you know, I lived in Singapore for 17 years. The, the Singapore armed forces, I mean, they haven't been in battle. Um, it's a it's a, it's a subs, subscri- uh, national service, so they you know every seventeen year old has to go and serve a few years. Um, but the very highly technological service, and they 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 teach coaching, right? So they they teach the empowerment and the engagement because most times it's not crisis. Most times it's ongoing development of skills and development of thinking. But they also teach when the you know, proverbial hits the fan, here's how you issue a command. So we need both. So there is contingency leadership that says, you know, look at where the company's at, choose the leader for that situation. And then there is uh, uh, you know, much more adaptive transformational leadership saying, well, the leader needs to have the self-awareness and the flexibility to adapt to the culture and or create a culture. And a lot of research is saying you, know, you can create a culture of psychological safety and you can bring your people up. That's, a, that's the best leadership style. It is unless you know, we have a pandemic and all the plans went out the window and sometimes we need to say, you do this, you do this, and you do this. Andrew, uh, before we wrap up, if you could offer one, two, or three pieces of advice to leaders who are starting starting their week starting their day and what what tips or ideas on the self conversation they should have with them before they go out to meet with their team uh, the advice i always give is to schedule some time in every week for self reflection and if you if you know if other people have access to your diary create a project x or a, a client mr black and block that in your diary right now and this is straight out of stephen covey you know put the rocks into the diary first and you know make sure you can go somewhere and i i use an i use an electronic notepad it, it feels like paper um, and I, I go somewhere and it's got nothing else on this app. I won't use an iPad for this because all the other apps pop up. And I go and I, I, I spend you know, my hour, what, what am I going to do this week? What am I going to achieve? What are the important things? And I encourage every leader to do this. And over and above that planning session, if you constantly um, journal, you wake up in the morning, how am I feeling? What am I objecting? At the end of the day, what did I learn? What am I going to do differently? That in itself will transform me as a leader. Um, I have one client who I have coached for over 20 years. He was a 30-year-old software entrepreneur when I first became his his executive coach. Um, He was CEO. I helped him IPO that company. I helped him with several other companies that he's led. And we're, we're friends to this day. And he constantly journals, he's constantly reflected. He's, and he comes to me with the question, he says, okay, so I've been thinking about this, Andrew, how do you think I should approach this? And he has that because he spends that awareness. Now, when I first met him, he was too busy to do any of this. And I, I said, you go to the library or you go to the coffee shop, you leave your Blackberry, because that's how long ago it was, people have Blackberries. And I'd say, you leave that with your PA and you go and you spend. And he said, I don't have time for this, I don't have time for this. And then after a period of time, he said, I don't have time not to do this because every time I do this, I get five or six hours of productivity back. It's much more important that I focus on this. So that is the most important thing. Self-aware leaders, at the moment you're self-aware, you become more other-aware. You become to think, instead of being reactive to situations, you go, 
Well, what's driving that? What, what are the forces that are making that happen? What's behind that person's behavior? What's their positive intention? And you can have those questions. So that's number one. Number two is read, read voraciously, read everything you can. If you don't have time to read, get audiobooks. Audible is a client of mine. You know, you get the books on Audible. Uh, you, know, you can go for a walk so you can work the body and work the mind simultaneously, stick some headphones on. Read is essential. And the third one is, is, is have fun. I mean, just don't be a leader all the time. Go spend time with your family, go to spend time with friends um, and, and do something for your community. But, and this is where I, in the introduction, where I, I worked with at-risk teenagers in Singapore with a charity, where I gave some of my time where I could, I could teach these self-esteem, self-confidence, communication and leadership skills to teenagers. That helped me grow as a human being so much more than the stuff I was getting paid for. And you know, I, I find that the best leaders are doing something outside of the day-to-day the -day, nine to five stuff that they're being paid for. And it makes them grow as human beings. Um, and I'm very proud to, to uh, you know, some of the philanthropy that has been set up by some of my clients who go, okay, well, I've been making millions of dollars for my company, but what, you know, could I not set up a not-for-profit and make a difference there? They are so much more energized by that, and it prevents them reaching burnout. Because anytime you do something for somebody else, what you get back is tenfold. Valuable advice, Andrew. My guest today is Andrew Bryant, reminding you that what who we are is different from what and how we do. 